and um, you, you talk a lot about, for instance, what's happening from the transition of secondary to tertiary. But you, you cannot build a superstructure on a weak foundation, right? And that's where the concern about the basic level of education comes in. Have you done an assessment of the basic level of our education system in this country? And what are the specific interventions to address them? You see, the, the point of the matter is this. In other jurisdictions, developed nations where education have tremendously improved the fortunes of the nation, uh, you don't allow students to go to school from KG to junior high school before you do your first national assessment. So in Ghana, when students go to school, the nation knows nothing about them until after 11 years, two years of KG, six years of primary, three years of junior high. That is when we begin to say, oh, what is going on with them? 11 years. Too late. Too late. So that does not follow international best practices. So when, when, if you ask me, before last year, if you ask me that, I'll tell you I don't know. This is the first time we have school level data, we have student level data, we have regional level data, we have district level data, national level data, and there has been some sh shockers. For example, Ahafu happens to be the highest performing region in the country. A student gets to junior high school one. All the teachers know that that child cannot read, right? But within the curriculum that the school is implementing, their hands are tied behind their back. They don't have an intervention in English for that student. And then you hear about after school, <laughs> parents should pay, right? But the kid is sitting in the school during the regular school day. You didn't seize the opportunity to support him to improve on English, improve on mathematics. But they will tell you they don't know. But now we know. So the student who walk into junior high school year one, both the assessment from primary six on the national standardized test and any in-house assessment will tell us the students who are struggling. And then what we are saying is this. We are now developing a policy for intervention that says, instead of taking nine courses, that student can do additional English, additional writing if they can write. So that you limit even the number that they do on the BEC. So, what we are looking at is the second term of the president, a common sense approach to improving learning outcomes. Because we've done the macro level, but this has to trickle down to the student who is sitting in front of us in the classroom. And that also fits into, because after making sure that, yes, you assess them, you get the right data, it also fits into the kind of curriculum, the details of the curriculum that, that, that you're going to use. So, so that's why you have backed on this curriculum reforms. What's the state of affairs with the curriculum reforms now? Training has been offered um, at last the basic level. They've been introduced. Now the good news is that textbooks are going. Uh, the you started distributing oh, yes, the textbooks? This, oh, yes. I was... Um, Appointed term publishers has finished theirs, it's going. Most of the publishers have completed it, and textbooks are going to be hitting the classroom. Distribution is ongoing now. I think it's going through the regional warehouses from there, it's going to the classroom. So the good news is that the students are now on vacation. And by the time school opens, a number of the schools will have received uh, textbooks so that it will complement um, the teaching and learning process so that we can all get better outcomes. But um, um, I'm excited. I went to the printing house myself. I saw you. I was there. Oh, oh you, you were there? Said, how many pr publishers were engaged and how many of them have finished and the textbooks um, dispatched? I will not be able to give you the, the percentage of those who have finished, but I know that we got reports from about four of them. The, the, the deputy minister has also visited a number of the publishers. But I'll be able to get your listeners an opportunity, your viewers the opportunity. After this interview, we'll get a number and then we'll forward it to you. And you'll be able to tell your viewers as to how many, as of today, have completed and have distributed. And then we'll be able to also update your viewers in terms of what time it hits the various schools. Uh, but um, the good news is that the assurance is by the time they get back to school, when Tesbos. school reopens, Tesbos. this is in September. Tesbos. Yeah, textbooks will be going. And, and I'm excited about the fact that uh, the public, most of them have met uh, their timelines ahead of schedule. So, so it's good.
policy. But you also acknowledge um, the concerns that others raised about the absence of the textbooks and how that was impacting on the effective implementation of this new curriculum. I'm the teacher in chief. How would I question you on that? If you bring this you up, I'll say yes. It could have been done better. Uh, but the good news is that it's there. And uh, when I visit classroom and I teach like I did at St. Mary's, um, there were books there that I was able to use and it facilitated the process when I took core crew and I read with the students. So, of course, when you have it, it enhances what you do. And there was a, uh, it was a learning process. And um, yes, uh, things will get better because the teachers will have the resource that they can use to complement what they do. How do you answer those who say that maybe this process should have preceded the implementation of the new curriculum in the first place? Actually, it's not done. International best practice is that our publishers need time. So when you say curriculum is adopted and, and, and delivered, what you do is that you get some materials for teachers to work with. But I'll say that it shouldn't take two years, right? So I, I concede that it could have been fast-tracked. Uh, but I inherited um, a challenge. It was an opportunity for me. And um, we facilitated a process so that we can get it done. Is government considering the proposals to review the senior free senior high school program? I have not received any proposals as a minister for education. What I do, I serve at the behest of the president. What he tells me to do? It's what I do. I have not received any proposals from anyone. We are the IMF. We are faced with an economic crisis. And the impact that it is having on government finances. Is there any justification for the continuous financing of the free senior high school in its current form? Or you being the leader or the lead implementer of that policy, you would consider views of a review of the policy so as to ensure its sustainability in the wake of the economic crisis that we are in. Ghana is a beautiful country. In other jurisdictions, if government says I'll do something, nobody questions it. <laughs> so it's a beautiful nation. Um, if government says I have the space and I'll do it, we allow the government to do it. That is their commitment to the nation. You see, when we talk about free senior high school, to some of us who are privileged, right? We look at it through a different lens. When you go to my villages in Bosom Chen, you go to Bonkoko, look at the opportunity this has presented to them. They are sitting on edge thinking that the opportunity is going to be taken away from them. I want to assure the people of this country, the people of Bonkoko, Bontefufu, and all these villages, that their opportunity will not be taken away from them and that the president is fully committed to the implementation of free senior high school. And that is what I have. I serve at the behest of the president. What he says is what I do. Well, the finance minister says the review of a free senior high school program is always on the table. And in fact, that you, the minister of education, is I serve in at conversations. The I serve at the behest of the President of the Republic, the one who recruited me to come back to Ghana. He visited my school in California, and he said, Dr. Duchum, I need you to come and help me implement Free Senior High School. I'm here. I'm implementing Free Senior according to his dictates. What he tells me to do is what I do. I see. I need a clarity because of what the instance that the finance minister made reference to. So that, hear so the that because say, he made the statement that you are also in conversations to see how parents brother, can also take part of, for instance, brother, the I haven't meeting. heard that from the president. I serve at the behest of the president of the republic, Nana Adodan. How much has been sent, spent on the Free Senior School program since the last six I'll, years? I'll, I won't sit here and give you that data because I. I don't have it in front of me. I don't want to make a mistake. I will send it to you. I've asked my staff to reconcile uh, whatever data they have with that of finance so that uh, it will be the same. So I, I don't want to contradict anybody. But for this year, it's 2.3 billion. That's captured in the 2022 yes. budget. Yes, yes. Has, has that money been released? Uh, of course. What you have the 2.3 billion. No. Budgeting and disbursement doesn't align that way. <laughs> it, it, it's just like you know you're going to be paid two thousand a month, right? So it's twenty-four thousand a year. They don't give you twenty-four thousand, 
Every month, based on your need, you get disbursement. So we have a cash flow plan, and we are getting disbursement based on the cash flow plan that we have jointly developed with the Ministry of Finance. Recently, some senior high schools experienced shortage in some food items. Have you dealt with that problem in totality? I think, I think the bottom line is that there was a, um, what I call the supply chain challenge. Because before the current economic situation and the inflation, suppliers were willing to supply and they wait for three months to be paid, right? But now suppliers are saying, I can wait. My money will diminish in value. So it, it was a point in time when the suppliers came. So we had a big meeting with them. They said, no, 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 we can no longer wait, right? So you have done your cash flow projections, and you thought that if you get this amount, you'll be able to pay the suppliers now. They will supply the next two months, more money will come, and then you pay them, and then they say, we can't. So you are at your worst end at that point, trying to struggle to find out how do I do this. That is why we came up with an emergency plan, make sure all schools have the items that they needed so badly, uh, keep them moving, and we are continuing that trend of ensuring that the items that are needed urgently go to the schools, we go to controller, we get some funding, and then we also do what is called perishable. Uh, these are uh, the money for salt and other items, tomato, that the headmaster had to go to the market and buy. So we are working, it's a work in progress, but there was a major disruption of the process whereby a supplier had to wait and sometimes they had to wait even beyond the two months. But because the value of their money was not diminishing, they were, they were willing to wait. But now they have a challenge, and therefore we had to invent a new way of creating a sustainable supply chain management system uh, so that food items will go to the So there's an understanding. They are supplying food now. Yes. I see. Because the last time I checked, the northern region conference of heads of assisted senior high schools chairman said that look the schools don't have food so the senior high school that's ss shs one students who are supposed to report yesterday should stay at home in fact they were contemplating sending the shs two students home that's not accurate i had a meeting with buffer stock you see food is supplied by buffer stock not the ministry of education it was a cabinet decision. So uh, buffer stock that's under the Ministry of Agri is the one that provides the food to the schools, and then we pay them. We had a meeting with the buffer stock uh, two days ago, and um, conference call. Uh, they gave us how they are dealing with the situation and assured me that uh, food should be going to the schools. That assurance I got from them, because I'm not in charge of food distribution, but. Uh, the buffer stock company gave me the firm assurance that um, the schools that are opening will get food items uh, to keep the students fed. I see. And so that's based on that assurance, we, we, you're saying that we should not expect any news of shortage of food items in senior high schools in, in the coming based weeks on, or months? Based on the assurance that I got from them, I can say that. But I want to emphasize that the Ministry of Education is not directly in charge of food supply. The portion that we deal with is disbursing money to the head to take care of the 30%, uh, which is the perishables. But the 70%, which is food items, come from buffer stock. I had a firm assurance from them, together with the President of Charles and Secretary of Charles. We met here, put them on the phone. They gave us a firm assurance that food items will be going to every school. I checked in this morning, and some heads of schools, of course, I couldn't call everyone. Those that I spoke with said, yes, they are getting some items from Buffer Stock. So I'm hopeful that the Northern schools uh, will get the same items that are going to the Southern schools based on the distribution uh, schedule. So when, when this issue came up, the proposals that there should probably be a review of the engagement between the education ministry, the buffer stock, and the food supply, so that the heads of the schools now, as was the case previously, would have the right of identifying and engaging their own food suppliers so that they would have de developed some level of goodwill, understanding. So if there is a crisis situation where the money is not coming in, based on that goodwill they built, the food suppliers can still supply food to them and they will not have a shortage of food items. Well, the, when it's inflation and the person believes they are losing their capital, it's not about goodwill. 
But first of all, they got good with the supplies. But it was a crisis where they felt that we can no longer do two months and three months and even five months. We need it now. So that will not solve the problem. Um, the Minister of Finance have done well releasing funds and want them to continue to release funds in a timely uh, manner so that supplies will keep supplying. That is the solution and not headmaster developing relationship with uh, supplies. Buffer stock has that relationship yeah. with supplies. Finally, there was a recent investigation by Corruption Watch on examination leakages. And has the ministry seen this? Yes, of course. They came to show it to me before they it went public. They went public. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this is, this is something that's not new because, for instance, Africa Education Watch has been consistent about what's happening with examination leakages. Yes. So I'll tell you, uh, WIC have many proposals as to how you solve this problem. I'm concerned that some of their solutions will not work. Why solutions will not work? Yeah. When you talk about recruit ambassadors who preach the children not to cheat, it's not going to work. Why must wake up and smell the coffee? And we're going to get them to wake up and smell the coffee. You get why to wake up? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I said it. I said it. We've told them, and we're going to tell them again, that you have to remove the incentive for cheating. The incentive for cheating has to be eliminated. And yes, we do this exam to West Africa, right? So when I make proposal as Minister for Education, because the President at the State of the Nation said leakages, examination more price should be eliminated in this country, I go to work on it. When I make a proposal, because it's the whole West Africa, it has to go through a system. That is why I cut them a slack. But you know that last year, examination leakages so far as BEC concerned was eliminated. How was it eliminated? They did what we've been telling them to do, which is called serialization. Parallel exams. Sit in the room with you. We have different questions. Different regions with different questions. So last year when the BEC started, the people who create the rogue website, so that is what I'm saying sometimes they are proposal. They have to get to the bottom of it. They've been lamenting about rogue websites, right? Mm -hmm. Where people create and they sell examination questions, right? Mm -hmm. They have invested time and effort, national security, everybody worried about rogue website. But how is it that the rogue website were pulled down last year by the people who created them? Because WAEC removed the incentive for cheating by creating different exams for different regions of the country. So the moment these people saw that the questions were different across the country, they themselves issued a statement on their website and say it didn't work out. And that was the end of rogue website. The developer themselves pulled it down. So what I'm saying is this. We are going to forge ahead and demand that at the West Africa Examination Council WASI level, right? The same thing that they did with BEC that put to bed leakages can be done. And we are demanding that it should come all the way to a level where you have parallel exams within the hall. That I'm sitting with you, my question one may be your question 20. And even when the questions are the same, the multiple choice questions are scrambled in such a way that your answer is D and mine is A. So if teachers want to go and hide in the bush, can they answer 20 versions of the question before time is over? They can't. So the thing is this. They did it with BEC. We need to do it with WASI and eliminate the incentive. If you want to leak the questions, you leak 10 versions, the student is uncertain whether he's going to get version A or version 1 or version 10, therefore he won't buy. He'll rather study. Until we get to e-testing, where there can be 10,000, 20,000 of the same question on a server, and it's being released to us individually, where you know you can't cheat, we have to do serialization take away the incentive for people to leak examination questions, 
And you don't have to worry about all this BNI involvement and police involvement, national security involvement. We need to remove the root, cut the root, and get it out. The same way they did with BEC last year. They need to let Ghanaians know. They did a fantastic job, and I commend WAIC for that. But we need to move another level to and work with the school. other West African countries and let them know that Ghana wants to change its education system. We want to remove the incentive for cheating. We want students sitting in the examination hall to have different type of questions, the same level of difficulty.